Well, praise the Lord. Oh, what happened to you? Somebody threw something on you while I wasn't here. Okay, praise the Lord. Aren't you excited? I am excited. The world is about to see your brightness. The world is about to become a better place. Things are about to shift. It's more as the pity if everything happens in here. I can't wait to get out there, man. I can't wait. As I drive along, I'm already speaking to, to entities. I, I'm, I'm already affecting, you know. There's something about light. It can't be contained. Even when you shut the door on light, a little bit of, as long as there's space somewhere, it can peak. That's how uncontrollable you are. That's how influential you are. I told you when I came in here first day, the Lord spoke to me and said, limits are removed. Boundaries are broken. There is something about light that people can't hide uh, a light. It's very, very so. That's why the Bible says nobody lights a candle and puts it under a bushel. Whatever you do, that light will betray you. And tonight I pray and I thank God and I celebrate with you that your light will betray the darkness. It will betray, it will expose the darkness. You've got to learn to usher in what God is doing. <laughs> I heard the word today. I have been saying it. I went, to, I went home. I said it in my car. I said, I'm setting something ablaze with my tongue. It is no use if you hear the word and you don't practice it. There is always grace upon what you hear for that moment. You're going to need it. If you let it go, you know it's something that's going to grow cold. You've got to water it. You've got to stir it up inside of you. You've got to practice it. I've learned that. I'm hungry for some more. Father, we thank you tonight that you have manifested yourself over these couple of days. You have used great men and great women to speak to your people. You have stirred up something. You have brought direction, God. You have entrenched something. You have shown us the future. But you are the God of the more. We want more tonight. Somebody say, I want more tonight. I want more tonight. Lord, we have not even touched anything yet. All you have shown us is what we can have when we focus, when we gather like this, when our intent is on you, when we desire you, God, when we unlock that cold called hunger and righteousness. So, Father, we ask of one thing. Satiate this hunger, but give us more appetite. Expand our capacity for more. Speak truth by my lips today. Bring transformed thinking, transformed hearts. Lord, I ask of you one thing. That you put that key and you begin to ignite. Lord, it's fine to have a hundred thousand pound car. But without somebody turning on the ignition. And Lord, you know my heart. I can't wait to see you out there shining as lights. I came to see you out there. Other people have a, have a calling to do what they have to do in this place. I have a calling to push you out of there into the outside space. And that's what I want to see. You may be seated. I want to tell you something about the more. I, as you pray, don't, don't ever be satisfied. You know, um, Paul in his writings, he talks about, I pray to the God and the Father of lights. I think it's Ephesians chapter 3. And it's so good to see you, apostles. Good to see you. Uh, great, great men of God. Thank you so much, Apostle Israel. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for the intensity. I said, Father, this man is an intense man. Is he not an intense man? There's an intensity that he brings to the altar. There is something, you know, some people think God has favorites. No. God watches your attitude toward what he's offered you and what he hasn't offered you. I learned a few lessons. I, maybe you've heard me say this. I said one of my favorite people, one of my favorite teachers in scripture is Cain. My God. He killed his brother. Came under judgment. God judged him. And the guy said, I know you. I'm not taking that judgment. How does a murderer tell God I know you have a right to judge me, but I also know you have bowels of mercy. Ameliorate this punishment. Because the moment you drive me away from your glory, I'm done. I have no covering. I have no purpose. I am a marked man. How does a sinner, how does a, a murderer learn to value that which he sees inside of God? I believe Cain himself was an intense man. 
God loves intensity. And when this man of God takes a hold of God, I guess you're one of those people who stand between the altar and the porch. And I guess you're one of those people who say, you are my friend, God. And I guess you're one of those people who won't shut up or let up and let go. Until you see, God is looking for some people like that. You hear me? God is, the earth is crying out. This morning, we looked at the land mourns. I came to tell you today. I am, really, I am, can I tell you a little secret? When I pray, I don't pray for more priests. I don't may pray for more pastors. I pray for people out there. My God, you have no idea. I said the land is mourning. I don't look to politicians. I don't look to technocrats. I don't look to CEOs. There is a power that can solve the problem. Everything that was created is subject to the creator. I started to tell you about a hunger. There's a reason why Jesus says, you know, uh, there's a hunger and thirst. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, God will fill you. God put hunger inside of you so you wouldn't die. <laughs> God put thirst inside of you so you wouldn't die. Because the moment you forget to drink, you'll die of dehydration. Therefore, the moment you forget or you neglect a hunger for righteousness, you will walk where you shouldn't walk and do what you shouldn't do. I always try and change the way people pray. I think we pray a lot of unnecessary prayers. I come to God, I say, I want more hunger. Because as long as I'm hungry, I will stay in the kitchen. As long as I'm thirsty, I will open that fridge. I will walk around water. So the problem is not God, give me water. He knows I need water. The problem is I don't have a thirst. I'm cha I, you notice, I'm changing the way you pray. As long as you have a thirst for God. God's problem with Esau, he didn't have an appetite for glory. Everything you don't have an appetite for, you will soon transact and trade with, for something else. Everything you don't have an appetite for, you will transact and trade. Listen to what Esau said. He said, what good is this thing to me? This is a whole heritage. You have been appointed from your mother's womb. You fought your brother. Your mother would have told you that your brother has his eye on this thing. But by the good mercies and grace of God, you came first. It's yours. And the moment a little bit of a discomfort comes, his perspective on the privilege and the honor he has to represent God to a degeneration is warped. Anything you can also postpone, you are not worthy of having. Esau never said he didn't want the brightness. He said, right now, what good is it to me? If God says it's good for you now, you may not understand. You better take it and protect it and guard it. Because there's one thing that insults God. It's people who devalue what he makes available for them. I started to tell you something, and I started with this man's fault. I pray that we will all have an intensity. Sometimes I think it's a bit too much. I was going to talk to him about slowing down a little bit. That too is good. That too is coming. Post this. But there is an intensity that grasps the attention of God. You know, do you know that God has secrets he wants to share with you? You haven't showed up yet. Malachi is troubled about his community. He's troubled about his city. Troubled about his nation. And in Malachi 1, he keeps asking, uh, Habakkuk, I beg your pardon. He keeps asking God. God doesn't answer. Until in Habakkuk 2, he says, God, I set myself upon a watch. I am leaving this place till you talk. I wonder what would happen if you told God, I don't like what is happening in the United Kingdom, and I'm not leaving your face till you talk. <laughs> what would it look like? 
May God produce an Habakkuk spirit in us. Listen, he says, I'm, I set myself upon a, a topos, a specific place of opportunity, that I may watch what he will say to me, that I may see how I will. I'm also not just interested in what God will say. I'm interested in my response. Finally, he gets God's attention, and God says, you ready? Write the vision. See, a lot of times we take it out of context. Write the vision doesn't come first. The appetite to hear what God has to say to solve a problem in your context comes first. The moment you have that appetite, it produces the intensity and suddenly God is ready to unload something he's always wanted to unload. May God give us such a hunger, such an appetite. So I started to tell you, come back to why I started this thing. That God is the God of the morning. Paul prays and he, he prays in Ephesians 3 and he talks about God. Uh, 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 he said, let me just get there. He talks about the according to of God, the, the things that he's asking. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory. God is not granting you any. Paul says, God, give them according to your capacity. Give them according to what you have. Can you imagine what prayer would be like if you ask God to give you according to, not what you think, but according to his capacity to deliver? You see, he's the God of, you've just had a taste and an appetite. It is said of Napoleon Apostle that, you know he had an empire, he had a collection of nations, and people would come and say, Napoleon, give me this, give me this community, give me this city, give me this city, give me that, and his age would be so angry. Why can't they ask for small things? Why can't they just ask for simple things? Why can't they ask for a little bit of money? Why are they asking for big things from you? And Napoleon would laugh and say, they honored me by the magnitude of what they asked me. You didn't hear me. What would it look like if you asked God for your whole community? He said, they honored me by the magnitude of what they asked me. All morning when I wake up, I didn't sleep last night. And I was praying. And I kept thinking God was asking me while I was showering. When was the last time anybody says, give me UK or I die? You would. Because of your intensity. I don't know about you, but I want kings or I die. What did you last ask God for? That would devastate you if you didn't have it. What would you ask God for that was improbable, that was incredible, that was major, that was big? This meeting, it's not just you would have an amputation. It would create a desire to see things like how God sees things. It would create a desire in you to want things like how God wants. The earth is not waiting for blessed, anointed believers. It's waiting for God to appear as sons. Amen. Somebody's going to hear me sometime. I'm going to go back to Isaiah. I just want to finish off what I started this morning. and I'll be quick. Somebody keep time for me, please. Isaiah, I'm going to read back to, I want it so bad. I want to see cities. I will be disappointed if we went through all of this and nothing changed in our context. You know how we're going to know this is a successful meeting? It's by the things you go on and change. It's by the things that change in your space. <laughs> it's by the things you affect and affect when you leave this place. That's how we know that this has been a successful meeting. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of God has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. 
The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. We like that. What are they coming to us to do? Your son shall come from afar. Your daughter shall be nursed at your sight. Then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart shall swell with joy. Because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. And those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedah shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebuchadnezzar shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar. And I will glorify the house of my glory. Kings come. But they will only get as far as the light shines. They will only come as far as your light shines. Because your light is a radar. It's the GPS they follow. It's the attraction point. As moths are attracted to light. When you dim the light, they can't come because there's nothing to attract. And I dare to say to you this evening, kings are wandering the earth looking for a light they can go to. See, we have believed the opposite, that it is difficult for kings to come. But the truth of the matter, Lady Ajoke, is that kings are roaming in the dark, stumbling, because they can't find light. And I would, are they searching? Yes. When Magi from the east saw the star, they traveled towards it. Every time people see a star, they travel towards it. Kings come to solutions. They don't come to noise. They don't come because you've been somewhere only. They don't come because you came to church. They come because of what church produced in you. <laughs> kings come to solutions. Kings come for answers. Your brightness could be your solution to someone's problem. That's what we're talking about. I want to break it down. That's all we're talking, brightness, brightness, brightness. It's a solution to an, a problem that is upon the earth. That's all it is. And quite rightly so. I told you about the anointing today. Nobody anointing is for them. That's why blind people can heal blind people. And doctors can save people from death and die them from the same disease themselves. Because that which you have was never yours. It was always intended for somebody else. Why do kings come to us? Malachi tells us why. He says, for the lips of the priest should keep knowledge. And the people should seek the law, governance, answers, solutions from his mouth. For he's a messenger of the Lord of hosts. Even kings know that they can only go to one place. You know how you see bad boys, I've seen gang boys, and they want church girls to marry. They don't bother that they are bad. But they know that if they get church girls, they'll be okay. I am praying, sir, for apostolic churches to rise up. I went to school in 1990-something in the States. I opened the bank account on college campus because companies came to recruit staff from the campus because they know if you get anybody from World Harvest Bible College, they will be excellent and diligent in their staff because banks knew this is the best way to recruit people. I'm like, God, we need more of this upon the earth. You see, we have always believed that the world doesn't want us. But I'll tell you something. The world may not like your Jesus, but the world likes what Jesus produces in you. The world is so selfish that it can trade its own values as long as you can help them attain their goal. And that's where we are going with this. We don't want churches that are big. We want churches that are effective. I am looking in the KCM, I'm believing that you will be one of those. Where they will come and they say, you know, you don't believe me? You notice that when the Babylonians trashed the Jewish people, they brought out the intelligence the brilliant looking. And the Bible categorically said in Kings, they left the poor people to be vine dressers at home. What are they going to do? Even they knew where to go. <laughs> I pray 
that the world will find you. I pray that your business will be the one they come to. I pray that you will be the one they invite in. I know. As I'm sitting today, when I got home, my first phone call, I had a good message, call me. Because a law company wants to, me to come and teach their lawyers. They are moving offices to big one. And in this time where a dollar is say there, the only stalemate is this. I can't decide how much to charge them, and they can't decide. They are hedging. And I'm not saying, I, I, don't, I also want them to say, I don't want to say anything down. So that's where we are at the stalemate. Why would a law firm, why would an oil firm fly me from England to come speak to the executives? And sometimes I'll be talking this, and they'll be crying. Or they'll say, Reverend, see, you know, when you speak, sometimes we just want to run around the room. I know what they're talking about is the anointing they are feeling. I will just smile. <laughs> I don't know, ma'am. I, I really don't know why I'm crying. I'm talking to you, but I'm crying. I know why you're crying. I know why you're crying. I take a presence to the place. And that presence is also called the spirit of wisdom and understanding. I am waiting. You have no idea. I'm speaking today not as a preacher. I'm having a conversation with you as something that is driving me, as something that keeps me awake at night, as something that keeps me on my knees. And I say, God, when shall your church, your ecclesia appear? I have a jealousy, sir. I have a jealousy. I am so upset that every one of you got your management degrees from Greco-Roman places. When Jesus was categoric and says, this is how they do it, this is how, that is how you must not do it, but you must do it this way. But we don't have enough qualified people for the world to send to us, to train them, and we go to the very place he told us not to imbibe. I hope I'm talking to somebody today. If I can just leave you with an appetite today, I'm done. So they come to us. Why? They come for the glory of God, the weight of God, the significance of God is on us and in us. Glory is tangible. The Bible says the glory will be seen upon you. Its effects on your life will be noticeable and recognizable. Seen means it will be experienced. This is the Hebrew for the glory seen. It will be experienced by people. It will be discerned, it will be noticed, it will catch their attention. It will cause men to gaze upon it. It will bring them joy. It will make provision for them. It will present God to them. It definitely caused Nebuchadnezzar to proclaim God indeed rules in the affairs of men. The glory is the totality of the essence of God. When it is upon us, we don't just feel it. It has an effect on our surroundings. Isaiah 11.2 spoke about the sevenfold spirit. It speaks of the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon you. In this brightness of your rising, the spirit of the Lord is excellently seen upon your life. He's resting in a mighty way. The glory is upon you. It's, it's covering you. It is the spirit of the Lord. It is the spirit of wisdom. It is the spirit of understanding. It is the spirit of counsel. It is the spirit of might. It is the spirit of knowledge. It is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. People are attracted to us because of this spirit that is upon us. If you bring something to the table that men need, they will come to you and submit to your leading. Joseph became the father of Pharaoh. When the glory comes, listen to what the Bible says will happen. It is increased capacity for remarkable working. 1 Kings 4, 30, to 4, 30 and 34 says this. That Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. May the spirit of excellence be upon us in an awesome way. He said it excelled. When God's hand is upon someone, they must excel. May God take us out of the spirit of mediocrity. Brightness and mediocrity don't match. Say to yourself, awake that tongue, that fire of yours, and say, no longer will I be a, a mediocre person. There are things that I pray for. I pray for discipline. I pray for diligence. No longer will I be a mediocre person. Because that's not an expression of what is upon me. It's not a true representative. Verse 34 says, And men of all nations, from all kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. We know that the queen of Sheba came in 1 Kings 10. Regardless of what it may look like on the outside, kings are looking for solutions and will go wherever they think they can find it. Well, by the way, you know, nature abhors a, value, a vacuum. If they can't find it in the Christian faith, they will find it somewhere else. Pharaoh didn't mind receiving counsel and solutions from a foreign convict. 
Pharaoh didn't mind making the foreigner a leader in his nation. Egyptians don't eat in the same room as a foreigner, but they didn't mind making one their leader and bowing to him. I refuse to eat in the same room as you because I don't see you as a human being. But when I'm in need and you can provide answers, I don't mind making you my ruler. They may hate your guts, honey. But when you bring something as a solution to the table, they can't help themselves. Pharaoh didn't mind making a convicted felon a member of his covenant. Pharaoh didn't mind making a convicted rapist the second in command of a nation. Pharaoh didn't mind giving someone accused and jailed as a sexual predator the precious daughter of his chief spiritual leader. When I tell people, you fast too much, can I talk to some Africans here? Everything is witchcraft, 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 witchcraft. Joseph went to bed with the chief witch's daughter every single day. She must have poured some juju stuff in the soup. If she was a good juju girl, her mother would call her, come here. Don't just sleep with a man like that. Pour some of it. Bring the pillow. Incantations. It's what we're all afraid of. The last time I checked, Joseph still fulfilled destiny in spite of the fact that he was in bed with the chief witch's daughter. Fear is a snare. And I think the enemy has snared us. Pharaoh didn't mind entrusting the nation's resources to a foreigner who had just come from a maximum security prison. You don't give money to a thief. But when that assumed thief has the answers that you need. By the way, you also notice how God, and I want to throw this in, because I'm going somewhere with this in a few minutes. God is so interested in the nation. And God doesn't want his church excluded from what happens in your city, in your nation, so much so. That he brought a partnership. You notice in the case of Joseph and Egypt, we all talk about Joseph. Nobody talks about Pharaoh. Pharaoh the prophet. Because when God wants to send a prophetic spirit to any man, he will. <laughs> It's not exclusive to us. God shows Pharaoh a prophetic picture of what's about to happen in the next 14 years. The only thing is, he has the prophetic picture. He doesn't understand it and doesn't know what to do with it. I can tell you many, pro, pro, many politicians have a prophetic picture of what's about to happen. They don't know what to do with it until the church shows up in the form of a Joseph to show them what to do with it. Nebuchadnezzar, neither the Daniel, neither the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel 6 says he set them as governors, as heads of, of, of communities, so that he might not suffer any loss. Darius and Daniel, Felix and Paul, I don't have time to stay there. Where you beg a man, you just imprison a man just so you can hear the gospel. I pray that it will happen to you and me. Just so you can hear the gospel. The Queen of Sheba, Mordecai. Where is your brightness needed? The brightness came to serve the people in the dark. The church is the only organization by design that doesn't exist for itself. Never. The only organization by design. It does not exist for itself. We are the light of the world. We serve God in all his glory to the world. The city, your nation, your community, and deep darkness in your brightness. If the church, I told you already today, if the church gathered on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, even on a Friday night, is our only operational strategy, we will not have the chance to infiltrate and redeem broken and dark systems of our world. People shape places, and places are shaped by people. Listen to me, I'm landing. There is civic and spiritual engagement mentioned with the coming of the glory and the brightness of our rising. We get all too spiritual, we forget it. Did he not say civic leaders will come to the spiritual leaders? We forgot. So what does kings mean in your life? Civic leaders will come and engage with you as a spiritual leader because you have something to offer. There must be a biblical view of engagement with our society. It's about revival and reformation. If you stay with only revival, we already established this morning that sin is not personal. It is institutionalized. It is community. If you make it a personal thing only, you're in trouble. 
And I think the church has made sin, the matter of sin and darkness, a personal matter for individuals only. You are not called kingdom culture movement for nothing, nor by chance. God chose people to show his power and presence, so we must make society important to us. We can't just want to preach the gospel of the kingdom to one person. We must demonstrate the gospel of the kingdom. So I just want to end by telling you the forces that shape our community. You see, has it been 45 minutes already? No, I'm just asking. <laughs> no, I was just asking. There are forces that shape our community because I just want to bring an arrowhead to what you're doing. I want you to land somewhere. When all is over by Sunday, what do I do with what I've got? That's what I'm about. What are the forces that shape it? Your career, your vocation and posts, your position are all pathways to effect change. The glory doesn't only appear or manifest when you are in the temple. As long as there are people, it will manifest itself there, wherever there are people. Through healings and through medical science, through deliverances and through education, through economics and through miraculous provision, through salvations and through God's chosen political leadership. Christians must learn to become proficient in the exercise of power. We must change our relationship with power. Get up in the morning and say, give me power in my city. Ah! Give me power. Give me authority. Lord, give me influence. I pray this every day. Well, if I come to you, Lady Ajoke, and I tell you I'm going to see President Biden, you better believe me. Remember we said something about in Corinthians this morning. Because we have a hope. What is that hope? The brightness of our rising will cause kings to pursue us. We speak audaciously. Did we not read it this morning? You can't have this and not speak audaciously. You can't go through what you're going through this week and not act audaciously. My God, you've been somewhere. God calls his people to wield power responsibly and use it to promote his kingdom ideals of righteousness, justice, and peace. Jeremiah 29, 7, 1 to 7, he says, seek the shalom. The end goal of all transformation is shalom. Shalom is not just a personal thing. Shalom is peace with God. Let's deal with the salvation hell thing. Broken relationship with God restores. Shalom is peace with one another. Our relationships, whether they be family ones or, 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 or friendship ones or whatever it is. And shalom is peace with your environment. In other words, the environment begins to flourish under you and around you. So being informed by the things that influence my neighbor is the first step in transformation. We need to learn how we see and hear carefully in our city. In our, are you hearing me? We need to learn how to see and hear carefully in our city so that we can have an accurate understanding. And this is where my angst is. This is where my cry is. This is where my frustration is. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is waiting for his comrades and his cohorts. And the Bible says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. I can tell you, whatever God is going to do here, the first thing that's going to happen is your spirit is going to be provoked when you walk out of here. So, Father, we receive the provocation of our spirits. Paul actually goes through the city. He sees where the marketplace, the synagogue, and the Areopagus is. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Do you know how many of us don't know what happens in our neighborhood? Do you know why I'm telling you all this? Because some of you, there's a part of my message I won't get to, but that's okay. But the Lord told me some of you are going to have to make big decisions after this one. He's going to call on you. The brightness of your rise. Some of you are going to have to relocate. Some of you are going to have to change jobs. Some of you are going to... There are some big decisions coming. There are some big decisions coming. There are some big decisions coming. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. We have bought into some kind of theology that everything must be posh with us. But there's a call when it comes that you deliberately move into the poor neighborhoods. 
Well, I just read it. Jesus left his glory and moved into a neighborhood. Because you can't redeem a people you don't know and love. A lot of our prayers, we make big noise, but we don't really know what happens. Do you know why you trust Jesus? You trust Jesus because he became one of you. So you don't go to him and say, well, you want me to be holy. You don't know how tough it is on this world. He's going to tell you, honey, I spent 33 years going through the same thing that you're going. We have a high priest who is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. So we trust him. Am I still making? I'm going to sit down in a minute. We saw the glory with our own eyes. Paul John says, we saw him because he was near us. People don't know us. We just invite them to a space on a Sunday morning. He looks carefully. Paul looks carefully. He observes the forces that are shaping the way the Athenians think. Outside of shape, shade room. Have you, I'm going there, aren't I? Have you observed the forces that are shaping the thinking of your community? Oh, I'm talking to somebody today. I'm sorry if it's bones, but that's okay. He was deeply moved and depressed. He was moved to the core of his being. He allowed the city to impact him emotionally. It was for him an experiential immersion. When was the last time you were immersed in your city that you refuse like Mordecai to be pacified? Yet you look, the influences that we see, that was their posture. You don't bring down a Haman in comfort. You bring down a Haman because you are in ashes. Because you've seen the danger that is waiting for your community. And you begin to weep. Verse 17 and 18, he engages the key sectors of the city. The academy, the synagogue, and the marketplace. I want you to know, don't make everything spiritual. We are spiritual people. But it's all right that your brightness is to make money in the marketplace. Don't ask to make money so you can boast that you bought a car and a house. You make money because you want to bring unemployment figures down. Otherwise, your brightness is of no use to us in the UK. Go to another country and show off there. I didn't say don't have a nice car and a nice house. I'm saying, this is how you employ your brightness. So that a child doesn't have to starve to death. So that people don't have to choose between heating. Otherwise, shut up. Can I be rude? Shut your face about, about because us and the politicians are no different. May God touch every one of our motives. I'm sorry. I'm just rushing. Do you, I hope you get me. So when you go to God and say, God, we heard the blessing upon our lives today. Lord, that which I make next, next year, my tithe, must be a sum total of what my income was this year. Because I have many mouths to feed. If you pray this prayer, see if God won't hear you. Listen, I don't, I don't have time. I can't do this. Jeremiah writes a letter and we all read it. Plant vineyards. Do this, do that. Do you know who he addresses first? The political leadership of Israel in exile. The religious leadership and the economic class. Every time there's a brightness. Because these are what we call a trinity of interests that shape every nation and every city. So always the religious, the political, and the economic. Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> as I sit down for the apostle to come and continue, cities have personalities. Cities have souls. I want to throw some things out for you too. Apostle, can I come back and do, and do a, a something else? We're going to get into this, right? 
We've learned about purpose, but we don't understand our city. That's why we don't know how to engage in it. Cities have what we call identity markers. The first identity marker is called an herb, URB, from which we get the word urban. That's the infrastructure of your city. Did you notice even the heavenly city has infrastructure? Most of the time, if you look, the infrastructure decides the difference between the wealthy and the poor. When was the last time, sir, you saw a betting or a gambling shop in a rich area? Even the council flats in rich areas look much better. That's why God is sending the brightness of your rising there to bring justice. To bring equity because God judges nations for those things. Then there are things we call. <laughs> are you okay with this? I know it doesn't sound spiritual. But if I had time I would quote you verse. I just want you to know these things. So that as you leave this place at the end of this week. You will know where this thing is going. You will know where you are making your investments. Because poverty is not about economics. It's about relationships. It's about the haves and the have-nots. It's about how people handle money. If you really felt a responsibility and a conscience towards your neighbor, you wouldn't be as corrupt as you are. Did you notice that the people who sell us credit cards and high interest don't have ones themselves? There's an anima. The anima is the soul of the city. It's the city's belief systems. So we have the city's urban systems. We have the city's belief systems. We are going to have to study that for the brightness of our rising. Sir, homework. For the brightness of our rising to be effective, we are going to settle. What is the belief system? We know about secular humanism. Where is it coming from? The shared knowledge is what we call anima. The poetry, the history, the music. And then finally, it's culture. Yeah. And then finally, we have what we call civitas. It's the behaviors of any city. When you think of Hollywood, what do you think of? Sex, entertainment. You think of Paris, what do you think of? Romance. Wall Street. Money, greed. Every city has these things. These are the cultural forces that shape our city. There is a reason why God linked your brightness to King's coming. Because he wants us to engage. Enough is enough when we've had spiritual moves of God that have dissipated because we didn't know how to protect it. Neither did we know how to engage it. This wasn't the message I came to preach tonight. But I wanted to finish. I see something on the horizon. I see something on the horizon. Men's back are against the wall. Leaders' backs are against the wall. Last Friday in our prayer meeting, we had the governor of a bank, of a nation, come online. I text her. I saw her, num her name. I said, do you want public prayer? She said, please go right ahead. There are times when I will have a call from a government and say, this is what's happening. We're having call, chats with IMF. We need you to pray. We need you to do something. I see something on the horizon. Shiftings are coming. Kings are going to call on us. They're going to call on you, your expertise, your solutions. Are you ready? I brought this thing because I feel like if we don't get ourselves ready, an opportunity will be missed. 
that we've labored and prayed for for years. The church is good at asking for opportunity. The church is not good at maximizing opportunity. I don't even know how to, I feel this. Can you lay your hands on your belly? I hope I've made sense to you. God is not into wastage nor dissipation. Everything you don't protect will be wasted. And if you don't do it, another generation will rise up who will engage. Did you think it was just mere chance that our millennials are bored with church? Because they don't realize it, but they see on the horizon that engagement. They are more prophetically postured than they realize. Don't pray for your children. Say, God, just protect them. Just, uh, just from every which one. Pray that when they open their mouth, wisdom and knowledge will pour out. Pray for the spirit of excellence to be upon them. From their infancy, from nursery, from the playground, the spirit of leadership will be upon them. Because out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, he has ordained strength. But I feel like God is saying, whoever is ready to be that solution center, yes, 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 yes. remember, your location is not who you are. Yes, yes. I just might have come from prison, but as long as I'm carrying something, I just must have, my reputation may have been torn apart, but as long as I'm carrying something, yes, yes. Pharaoh is ready to hear from me. I want you to pray for yourself right now. Let's take a moment.